we know about the brain? And how does the brain work? Can we take pictures of a brain to show if it's broken? Well, there are many parts of the brain and they work separately and they work together. I'm going to share some pictures, images, findings of how the brain connects with the fiber tracks and what the different parts of the brain do, not all of the brain parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about attention and how attention is different from memory. You know, a common problem with a brain injury is, I can't remember. I just don't think as well. It's hard to concentrate. I get easily distracted. So what do we know about mild injury? Well, usually you can't see the injury affecting the brain structure with traditional testing. And the injury disrupts a network, much like if you had a shortage to the, the, the telephone line going to your house or cables. There's networks of information processing that get disrupted. This is a picture based on a chimpanzee's brain that was uh, scanned with a nuclear uh, technique by Dr. Uh, Schwaman from Harvard. And it shows crossing fibers. The brain, as a mantle, has nerve cells. There's different layers of nerve cells in different regions of the brain. And then those nerve cells send fibers. That's the white matter fibers. And you can see looking on the viewer's right, a side view, and the viewer's left here, a cross-sectional view of those fibers. There's short fibers and long fibers, and those fibers carry bundles of information to and from different parts of the brain. What's thought to happen with a mild traumatic brain injury is the following. There's, there's usually a rapid change in flexion, extension, acceleration, deceleration, and as a result, those nerve fibers that are coming down the screen from the nerve cells, they twist and they shear. The resolution of an MRI is about a millimeter, maybe a little more. In that space, there's about 70,000 neurons. And a fragment of those neurons sending those fibers really isn't visible with traditional imaging. The fibers twist and turn. And on a microscopic level on the bottom, they form this onion bulb, which is a retraction, a loss of that uh, uh, white matter and the nerve cell uh, that can be seen under the microscope uh, under a dissection. And people don't go to get their brain dissected and look under the microscope for mild TBI. But this is how the, uh, the, the pathophysiology has been studied. I'll show you a picture of one of the patients who had an MRI done at the University of Illinois where they're able to image these pathway fibers called diffusion, it's called diffusion tensor imaging. It allows you to look at the flow of water molecules which follow the uh, arrangement of white matter fibers. It's not available at traditional uh, emergency rooms. Let's talk just a little bit about the brain without getting too complicated. As I'm talking to you here, uh, my face and the sound comes through to you. The information about where your butt is or your feet are sends proprioceptive information in. And somebody might be hungry or have to go to the bathroom, and that information is coming up from the limbic system. So the brain is designed as a machine to take information in from the outside world. That's called extrapersonal space. And to blend that with information that we have inside called the intrapersonal space. And then to figure out what to do with it. We have different senses from the outside world, and information gets processed in a hierarchy, just like going up a building from the first to the 50th floor. The picture on your left is a side view schematic. It's a graphic of the brain with the different brain lobes. I'll talk a little bit about the frontal lobe, since that's primarily where the motor fibers come from, and it's where a lot of decision making is made. The picture on the left is if you dissect it out, the outside surface of the brain, you'd be left with the inside of the brain. And, and this system was termed the limbic system because of the limbus or the uh, anatomical uh, tracting uh, around the ventricles. Inside the brain here, this is part of the limbic system. This is called the cingulate cortex. There's the limbic system inside the brain. And that uh, magenta picture uh, inside the brain schematic on the right uh, refers to the basal ganglia <clears throat> and the center picture beneath the green is the thalamus. Those all form part of the relay structures between the outside mantle or the cortex and the inside limbic system. Now you can, you can just relax here. 
This is just a, a relaxation slide. I don't want to get too detailed here. But what does the frontal lobe do? The frontal lobe takes this information and it helps us to determine what we're going to do. The frontal lobe has two segments that, are, that conceptually do two different things. One is information is taken in to make decisions, to plan ahead, involved with language and, and working memory, to figure out plans. The bottom part of the frontal lobe, right above the orbit, right above the orbit, right above the nose bridge, is called the orbitofrontal lobe. The middle part of the orbital frontal lobe is involved with reward systems that are pleasurable. On the lateral side, it's involved with aversive systems that say, don't approach that. The orbital frontal system is highly involved with dopamine, so some medications that you take might affect that. It's involved in mapping out, mapping out sort of like creating a glue that tells us from experience, if something is worth pursuing, it would re be rewarded, or staying away from, it would be aversive. Indeed, the orbital frontal lobe has been mapped out for things such as the smell of perfume or the appeal of chocolate. So motivation and reward systems closely tied in with the limbic system are part of the orbital frontal system. You, you can begin to get a sense of, depending on where those networks are injured, different symptoms will present themselves.